but there's something inside of you that is trying to actively communicate with you about how you should grow in the world and what you should grow into. How important is it to have a clear mission? Well, recently I just found out because with all of the transition that's happened this year, the sale of Onnit and all of the tumult and chaos that's in the world, I found that my own mission became a little bit obscure. I didn't know exactly where I stood and how to contribute to the world in the best way possible. And with that came all kinds of anxiety, hopelessness, a bit of depression. It was a really challenging period. And then my mission clicked in and I understood, aha, uh -huh, I know what I'm here to stand for. And when that mission clicked in, my life changed dramatically in all areas. And ultimately what I realized was that this is the go for your win map. This is the course that I created. It starts with mission. And then all of the other 14 modules included in the course are designed to bring you in a place where you're going for your win. Well, I'm going for my win once again. And we talk about this process. So for anybody interested in the course, go for your win. You'll learn a lot about that there. And there's also a lot of other great conversation, including an explication of the sacrifice required when you change your mind or when you're asking someone else to change their mind, which is really important for the time that we're in right now. So I hope you guys enjoy the show. The truth is, is that we're all the master. We're all the healer. We're all the mystic. Give it up one time for Aubrey Marcus. Eric Gazi, my brother. Aubrey Marcus, my brother. <laughs> These are the most interesting times that I think I can speak for the both of us and say that we've ever been in. Yeah. And for most human beings of our generation, at the very least, this is the, this is the most interesting time we've ever been in. Yeah. When we were looking out at the world, and there's a lot of things that we have going on, we're starting to figure out our role, how we can actually play a role that speaks to our spirit speaks to our heart is yeah. really us going for our win hey i see what you did there and in the world like what is the thing that we want to offer in this time because the landscape has changed the game board has changed yeah. we've gone from you know checkers to one of those what is it go or something like that i don't even know how to play <laughs> yeah. that you know it's like fucking really complicated yeah. we're playing pie gal not blackjack exactly. anymore and there's a whole another set of rules and new characters in a whole different environment that we have to function in so a lot of things are in flux for a lot of people. And you know, one of the things that I wanted to bring you on to talk about was how to use this map that we've created and cultivated and led hundreds, I guess thousands of people for by sure, now thousands, yeah. through this program of Go For Your Win, how it applies to the dynamic nature of the time that we're in right now. Yeah. Because the, the, the map still applies, but just giving people a little bit of support in figuring out, okay, I understand there's a lot of shit going on, but these core principles are applicable in any different epoch and any different time and how so, how they apply now and how different things may need to be thought about, but the right. same rules apply. Yeah, I was thinking about this yesterday when we, well, when I knew that we were gonna do this podcast and the um, poem that came to mind was uh, Yeats's The Second Coming. And I wish I could remember it by heart, but there is a part of the end of the first stanza that's, and the ceremony of innocence was drowned and the best of us lacked all conviction while the worst of us um, had passionate intensity or something like that. Mm. And there's something about that that really resonates, um, you know, the fact that he wrote this like a hundred years ago and he thought he was seeing the second coming and the beasts slouching towards Bethlehem uh i wonder what poem he would write if he were alive now same poem same i mean poem. this is this is new to us but right. it's it's an it's archetypical in, it's been in every different time period yeah you know at, before in all cultures there's been these moments that have arisen yeah you know and, and so this is like this is just our version of it right and when i was feeling into this map the thing that was coming up for me is it feels like what has happened the last two years has demanded absolutely for me and I'm, I, I feel for most people like 
there is the strongest call that there has ever been to look out into the world and try to do something significant that is beyond just you making your money for your family to have your things because something feels more wrong than it's ever felt before. And people are also going through this at the time where our stories seem to be the most fractured as they have ever been. Like a really weird thing to feel into is a couple of decades ago, a single source of information could produce a story that the majority of the Western world would receive at the same time in the exact same way through the same medium. And there was like a pulse that people could track. And there was like a narrative or a story that people could either resonate with or actively fight against, but it was like one clear dragon. Mm -hmm now with the rise of social media and the algorithms that oversee how those stories get to us it's hydra hydra it's a fractal hydra in every type of way reflecting back at you the things that make you the most angry or the most afraid because that's what the algorithms have figured out will keep you on the platform yeah just like porn when we were kids or at least when i was a kid maybe you slipped into the internet era <laughs> by the time you were still a kid but when i was a kid it was you you snuck a magazine from your dad right you know you playboy or if you got lucky you found a penthouse maybe or something like that and that was it and you you coveted that thing and you you know hit it and right. then you could maybe trade it with a friend <laughs> <you know>? like <laughs> but now there's obviously all of the tube sites of unlimited amount of porn, right? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and before, as you said, there was, you know, that one more singular narratives. And then now there's just a cornucopia of yeah. every different narrative. And it's really allowing like confirmation porn. 100%. Whatever you want the world to show back at you you can find it and the algorithms are programmed to give that to yeah. you and, and so, what people don't recognize is the thing that there's the emerson quote uh i don't care what you say uh i'll believe what you do that's what the algorithms are they don't care what you say you believe they care or they will show you what you care about because of what you tap on and what you watch and what you're getting back to you on the social media websites are very likely not the more beautiful world your heart knows it's possible. For me, it's thick thighs and basketball. For other people, it's gonna be, <laughs> for other people, it's gonna be like police shootings. Or for other people, it's gonna be like how something is rigged in this part of the game that like really triggers you. And it can give you this warped sense of what the, collective story is and the reason why i brought that up for uh the map that we're offering here is everything that i've ever studied in psychology the thing that i keep coming back to over and over and over again is all the greatest teachers or therapists or healers or philosophers that were into psychology they all agree that there's whatever you want to call it there's this force inside of you that seems to want you to sing or be a certain way in the world and people have called it the soul, the daemon, the genius, uh, your higher self, whatever. But there's something inside of you that is trying to actively communicate with you about how you should grow in the world and what you should grow into. And it seems that people are really disconnected from their ability to make meaning out of these incoherent stories because of the way the algorithms and the platforms and the technology are, are operating. But that if you could start with the authentic computer, that there is no in-between AI trying to optimize it in a way to sell your attention to advertisers. It's your nervous system. It's your dreams. It's your goals for the world. It's for how you feel when you're doing the things that give you flow and how you feel when you know when you're out of alignment. And that this map is our best attempt to like help people cultivate at least that connection yeah. to a quote unquote real story. And then maybe from that base, you can look out into the fucking pandemonium and maybe be able to do something other than just uh, become paranoid or crippled or cynical or uh, contributing to the noise. Or verbally violent, you know, yeah. in different ways. Uh, it seems as if, you know, part 14 of this course is a section on ignorance. And 
it seems as if it might make sense to just start with that in this discussion because the recognition of our own ignorance yeah. is really important even before determining because the course starts with determining your mission determining your you know your profession your connections whatever but w the mission may be actually tainted by a lot of false premises and yeah. a whole bunch of bias that's actually making you believe that you need to be this thing anti-vaxxer pro-vaxxer this you know liberal conservative but all right. of this is so so kind of manipulated on both sides like 100%. this is not me launching a criticism to either argument i'm just saying the system itself is designed as you as you suggested in this idea and this was something i i got from john verveke like we're in a world where we don't love the pursuit of wisdom we love the pursuit of victory it's philla philla nikea which is Nike, like your shoes, like the goddess of victory, like the the love of victory, being right is more important than the love of understanding the truth. Because yeah. our ego is attached to being right. We wanna be better than someone else. We wanna be right. We feel like we're worthy of love if we're right. That's just one of these many, many cognitive biases that go all the way back to evolutionary biology, yep. our attitude towards the other, our attitude towards disgust and our fear of yeah. different things impinging. There's so many factors that we have to consider that the very first thing before like charging ahead with your mission is really as they say know thyself yeah like really start to unpack the level of ignorance that we're really all of us all of us are in and at least get to a comfortable level where we say okay there's a lot of things that I may be right about, I may not be right yeah. about. Let me get to a comfortable place and use all my faculties, intuition, intellect, sensing, knowing, you know, all of these different things to really sort through what I feel. And it seems like we need to start there. Yeah, one of the things, there's so many things that come up, but one is uh, like the depth of that rabbit hole of our ignorance, like almost, uh crippled my brain to the point that if i had had people around me who could see how i was living when i was studying philosophy and psychology in college uh very likely would have been put into a mental uh hospital no exaggeration uh, i can feel my eyes watering as i feel into it and I, I think it's because we recently did ayahuasca and ayahuasca showed me a vision that helped me reconnect back to the um there's almost if you study cognitive psychology and evolutionary psychology enough, you can get to a point where if you hold the truth, you can't live. You can't like you you can't muster the conviction to do almost anything. So you almost have to like willfully like I acknowledge this, but and I'll come back whenever I get too hubris. Sure. But it's because the level of ignorance, you know, we could do a six hour podcast on like what cybernetics has taught us about how our perceptual system has evolved to lie to you and that everything that you perceive is actually a simulation from your nervous system taking what the objective reality is which is like an atomic swirl condensing it into useful icons that like make sense to bodies that have hands like this and grew up in the type of environments that we grew up in and that um you've evolved to think that you're smarter than the average person that you're you're more attractive than the average person that you're actually more important than the average person that you're actually less susceptible to bias than the average person and there's all sorts of studies in psychology that there's, just, a, there's actually a name for that bias it's like the the overconfidence bias right. or, that's exactly what it is yeah yeah and we all we all think that mm -hmm. you know we all believe like oh yeah yeah people are biased yep. <laughs> but we're like those people not 100%. me included in the in the people thing but and just holding that gently like it's okay yeah. like, it's okay we all have biases and we all have things and the willingness to hold those loosely is really what's required here to really understand mm. like okay let me let me really engage in this other in this other opinion let me really look at it yeah. and let me see and let me let me not run to all of the different you know tricks and and hacks that people do ad hominem attacks and references and conflating different mm -hmm. concepts that actually aren't related and going for the most emotional triggering thing yeah like, let's just hold this lightly and let's try to unpack this as calmly as possible and understand what really matters to me what really matters and where i'm at 
And we need to go through that with patience until we can then say, okay, now I have a, a good enough understanding of myself and a good enough feeling and I feel where I'm going that I can actually decide what to, you know, what to yeah. charge forward as my yeah. mission. It's one of the ways that I see it is like you have radiuses of competence that if you don't get mastery in the first layer, you can't do anything to layer out beyond that. And that what the current environment has done for more, for most people is it's bringing them out to the outermost layer of competence that they have absolutely no ability to act in like who among us have really earned the right through competence to be able to claim what the entire population should do? I would make the argument that probably no one. And how many people are talking about what should be done at that level? And if you asked anyone who knew them intimately about what is their level of competency over their smallest fear, mm-hmm the answer of them being like, oh yeah, they for sure have that down is like almost zero. And the tragedy that I feel when I'm with my friends who like they're good people, they have good hearts and they fucking care. And all they want to do is talk about the fifth layer of competence about like what should be done for the country or what should be done for a state or for the world. And I can look at their body and see the pathology unfolding from either the diet or from the way that they work out or from the way that they abuse drugs or whatever it is. Or I can feel how they just cut out people out of their life as soon as there's any conflict because it's love and light only, baby. Hashtag mm-hmm. 5D light worker. <laughs> and it's like, there's this thing that we do in our own self-deception where it's uncomfortable to look at the things that we actually have the power to do a thing about. And so we'll go to this fifth layer of competence and we'll fucking go on someone's Instagram account and say something in the comment section that we don't even have the courage to say to someone in person. And it's like, there's no one in anyone's comment section throwing hate who's going for their win. Yeah, no, it's very true. It's interesting, you know, even with people, you know, we were recently with a gathering of some of my favorite people on the planet and some powerful women in the group and during this process texas passed a law that uh, outlawed abortion Mm. beyond six six weeks and the general sentiment was outrage and you know i'm you know i'm i really it's not about my opinion and it's just not the point of me bringing it up but i just in the kind of socratic style asked them said okay like i hear your outrage and i feel where that's coming from and i see what you know, what that means to you. But if you were going to say, what is the cutoff at which you would say this is unethical to abort a fetus? And the answer that I got was eight weeks, actually unanimously, it was eight weeks. So, and then when, when that, when they realized that, that they were, they would actually put a, draw a line at some place too, but their line was just two weeks later. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, you know, the outrage was like, oh, well, you know, we're a little bit, we're a little bit off, but it's not, it's not what you think it might have been. And I'm not saying that, I'm not trying to make the claim that people shouldn't be outraged about this or right. whatever. Like some people might say zero days, and I honor like all of the feelings and all the opinions. That's not the point. The point is, is that very often our actual beliefs are not that different than what is right. out there. However, we get emotionally wrapped up and we, we go to the state of outrage yeah. when really if, we, if we're a little bit patient and say, okay, well, well, what is the amount of weeks that makes sense? Yeah. Certainly not, not 40, right. you know, it's, well, so, yeah. so where is it, you know? The thing that I feel there that actually feels super poignant to what we were just talking about is um, I would imagine that uh, these women that you asked, none of them would even have 1% the audacity to think that they understood this idea well enough and the repercussions of it well enough that they'd be willing to pass a law that would make people be compelled to act under their belief about it being eight weeks. And that the outrage is that there's old white men that they've never met who for them likely represent a lot of people who have treated them less than an equal because they were a woman telling them, 
I, I have the competence to be able to claim how all of you should use your body. <laughs> right. And I think that like, that gets to the crux of this. Like how many of our politicians can we see just by looking at their meat suit? Like you don't have this shit down. You do not have the first sphere of, of competence down. Yeah. What you have likely done is found the cheat codes to get some type of power that you probably inherited a decent amount from your parents and you're right on their coattails. There's all sorts of ways. But I think that that is the core there is um, what is your level of competence that you've earned the right to express power or force over? And, um, you know, go for your win is about working on that first core because it doesn't matter who you are. If you're trying to do that fifth layer and you haven't got that first layer down, I don't trust you. And that's a great, like, that's a great way to describe like why this is so important is that we get so lost in what we would do if we were president. It's like the ultimate armchair quarterback, but it's armchair president. You know, like if I was president, okay. Have you even been fucking class president? Right. You know, have you been a team captain? You know, like when have you made a decision for a group? Yeah. You know, let alone the whole fucking country or let alone, like it's it's this interesting thing, but what we can always get back to is, all right, let me let me figure out myself in a way. Let me get competence in how I can take aim and exactly. and hit the fucking target like hit the fucking target yeah and the process of taking aim and hitting the target this is going for the win which is the win it's really saying like okay here's my target here's the way that i line everything up and i figure out what it is i figure out what support i need i figure out how to cultivate the mindset that's going to allow me to get there and then overcome the resistance that's naturally going to come up right to get there and then you can apply that to some larger scale thing to everything because it's literally how your nervous system has evolved to propel your body through space like the rise of cybernetics has caused us to have to basically what is cybernetics for people who don't know so it's um once we got technology to a place where we were like "Ooh, we want to create intelligence like us uh they thought that they could first do it in a computer and then after enough scientists try to solve these problems they realize oh shit in order to even begin to do this we have to have a body too and so like the course of cybernetics is basically there was the goal of creating ai and then through the process of trying to do that they realized oh we need this type of constraint we need this type of constraint we need this type of constraint and it's like you need a body like intelligence is somehow embodied and then once you have a body it has to have filters on it in a very specific way in order not to require that it weighs, you know, a thousand tons in order to process. So it's like, basically, um, our bodily intelligence is like, we are going to ignore 99.99% of what's out here mm -hmm. uh, because we have instilled inside of us emotions and instincts. We're gonna go look at something that we're instinctually compelled to go try to get and then we begin to move through the world and try to do things. And if we fail, that's actually where we learn the most. And then when we get it, we get reward chemicals. It's like, oh, good job. You've evolved to regulate your nervous system by feeling like you're progressing towards a goal and then getting that goal. If your level of competence is not mastered in the first sphere and you're trying to do something in the fifth sphere, your nervous system is going to be fucked because mm -hmm. the goal the piece of food that you're hunting you, you're never getting and that the compassionate like other half of why this is important is it's like do you want to heal your nervous system make the goal today to be to go to the store yeah you know to fucking mow your lawn and you're you actually teach your body that you're doing something successful and that starts to regulate your nervous system and your emotions. You're probably going to sleep better, all, all sorts of shit. And then you might get to a point after like 10 years where it's like, all right, what we're doing with these power plants, I want to try to improve it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, there is many steps on the process. I've found for me recently that all there was a massive dysregulation that I had in my entire system throughout this whole year. One, you know, I transitioned from on it, which is a significant thing, beautiful thing. Um, then there, the whole world is 
a brand new world. Yeah. And everything that I was working on from book deals to other things, all of a sudden seems to need to shift to correspond with the world. I mean, I'm not yeah. doing it in a vacuum. That's why there's no there's no attained perfect state of being because you're always in conversation and a dialogue with your environment, the field that you're in. Yeah. And, so, and the field was moving more rapidly than I was moving. And I'm trying to figure out what the fuck am I, do what am I really doing? How do I take, I'm uncomfortable. I just had this discomfort and I would yeah. share, per, share some of that discomfort, like my revolution poem or something like, oh, I'm really uncomfortable with what we're choosing to spend money on versus uh, I'm like okay I can I can put that out but there wasn't anything that could really bring it all together and all of a sudden everything else that I was doing started to have less and less meaning to me yeah. and then so I was less and less satisfied with my contribution to the world and so I became more and more depressed and it was this process and then I would of course reach to my great allies the plant medicines did ayahuasca eight times this year <laughs> you know that's not an accident I'm fucking trying to figure shit out <laughs> help 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 so and finally, you know, like I fucking get it. And now I have a mission again. And that mission came out just recently this week as this concept of united polarity, which is really what I see. Cause I have my own opinions about the vaccine. I have my opinion, but I know they're just opinions and I don't want to get into, I don't feel qualified right. to like declare something. Yeah, I have stronger opinions about some things, especially about free speech. I have stronger opinions. I have stronger opinions about mandates and things like that, forcing people to do things. I do have very strong opinions about that. But nonetheless, the biggest thing that I want to stand for is reverence for all people. Like truly being, truly having that reverence for all sides and finding again the humanity so that we quit pulling apart right. and creating this dichotomy of warring factions left right black white red blue vax anti-vax all of a sudden everybody fucking hates each other and meanwhile the world is burning yeah like that cannot be like it cannot be otherwise like the dalai lama said we got 30 years on this bitch and we're out you know that's what the dalai lama recently said to my friend leslie schofield like that's potentially a reality yeah unless we can come together so what i'm what i really figured out like oh what do i really want to stand for it's like bringing everybody back together that third that third group of people which can be a part of the other groups it can be democrats or republicans or vaxxers or anti-vaxxers but they come with reverence for all beings and listening right and so i came up with that idea united polarity and then all of a sudden i had my mission aha uh -huh, aha uh -huh, also Mm. then life is colorful again yeah i'm excited i'm like energized again i wake up and instead of this crushing anxiety and feeling of lost and hopeless i'm like oh okay i fucking now i know what i'm doing and now everything else makes sense nothing else made sense before because i didn't fix that that cornerstone that lodestar that thing that helps me see through the dark yeah i didn't hadn't had that fixed yet it was nebulous so nothing made sense. what should i do with my fucking staff what should i do with my podcast what should i i don't know i guess grow it grow right. it for growth's sake right might as well that's the logic of cancer by the way <laughs> yeah exactly it's like there's no purpose yeah it was like i mean i'd rather think it's a healthy cancer but, <laughs> yeah. but nonetheless it's the same idea right that didn't nothing had a purpose there was yeah. no why there was no deep enough why it was all yeah all right it's to help people but it was so abstract yeah and now it's like oh, okay I'm here to unite the polarities, not to change the polarities, not to move everything from one side to the other. That's not the point. We need the polarities. We need those people who are conservative yeah. and we need the people who are liberal. We need all of these different ideas, these constructs, the people who want to push away the stranger, the people who want to welcome the stranger. Yeah. These are all ne necessities. Can we love that all of these things exist and love each other through that and then choose an even bigger aim? Like, hey, let's keep this infinite game going. And with that, like, fuck, man, like my life is back. There's like eight threads in there that <laughs> I'm really sorry. excited. No, that I'm really excited to try to pull and I'll, I'll probably get four. But uh, the first thing I think that is really important to highlight there is you literally made this map, you're 40, and you are proof that you will lose the thread even after you have found the thread because life is not static, yep. life is dynamic. It's like trying to learn to be an archer, but the fucking 
target is like on it's embedded into a wave yeah it's like, like schrodinger's cat <laughs> it's never it's never staying still and that there's so many people that take this course and they're like they think that their aim has to be the right one as opposed to a authentic try and that like hearing that you felt that at this age like i just really want to make that poignant for anyone who feels like there's no way that i have any idea what my thing is uh it doesn't have to be right you have to fucking take the shot the other thing that i think is really important and there's so much scientific data on this and it's that if you don't have a clear aim for your life you're going to feel depressed you're going to feel anxious you're more susceptible to disease you won't sleep well you're going to have trouble in your relationships and all of that shit condenses and aligns itself when you feel like you have a clear thing even if it's wrong mm. as long as you believe that you have a more beautiful world that you're moving towards and the actions that you do whether or not it's true if it feels to your nervous system as if it's successful all of that shit is going to feel better and so like this is almost like a prescriptive thing like do you want to feel better for yeah. sure try this and then the other six threads all had to do with the with the content with which what you shared and the first thing that the most poignant thing that comes to mind is we are the product of evolutionary forces that have selected for groups of lineages to compete with each other for finite resources because there could eventually be another land that you could go to there was always an increasing border for where like more resources are coming in eventually or you know if this doesn't go out or if we really fuck it up with this group we can just go over here that logic will not work anymore because we are for the first time in history a global tribe whether or not we want to admit it and our evolutionary biology does not want to admit it but our consciousness can know it we got one earth and we now have weapons that can end the game for all humans if one part of the earth tribe decides that they're upset enough and if we don't learn how to allow ourselves to disagree yet still cooperate we very likely won't have an environment where our grandchildren's grandchildren can drink the water mm -hmm. and like the thing it's so interesting but if you ever played a sport someone on your team could have been like a fucking racist or just a fucking asshole or who just believed wild shit you know like the government is trying to help you you know that i'm, I'm just joking <laughs> but <laughs> but that you guys can disagree and still cooperate within the game yeah and i think that that's the big thing that is missing in um like the current dialogue and i think the reason it's missing is because people are trying to compete at the fifth layer of competence and they don't even know what the fucking game is yeah like the people who are in comments or who are reposting stories or whatever like that's not for most of the issues the type of game or the arena where meaningful change is being made and yeah. so like i think there's just this massive confusion and um like the image that comes to mind is it's like fuck you and i turn around and i walk around and because it's a globe i end up back in front of you like there's nowhere to go yeah one of the things that i think what you were talking about brought up was it's it feels it's prescriptive to have a mission it's very important for us to have that and so when we take a look at people who are really passionate about something but we strongly disagree you know we can actually and we want to change their we want to change their mind to understand and have compassion that for them to change their mind they have to go into a mission vacuum it's an existential crisis it's an absolute existential crisis it's not only an ego death because their ego is attached to their mission i am the one who is for this well then it, if you're not for that then the i am shifts as well because they're inexorably linked right. in that way but it's also in that vacuum is this aimless purposelessness and all it's of depression. the study it's depression it's it's so many things so what you're really asking 
This if is someone's a good passionate about that, what you're really asking is for them to go through a massive crisis. I can't believe you believe that. Okay, yeah, 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 I get it. But remember that for them to change that, it's going to be incredibly painful. Such a good the point. phoenix has to die before it's reborn, and the death process is not fun. Are you confident enough in what you believe and passionate enough about it that you would have the person in front of you go through the hardest psychological experience of their life? Yes. Are you? Yes. And, exactly. and it's like most people, I think, myself included, I've never connected to this until right now, but what you're saying completely resonates. And it's like, do you realize what you are asking? Yeah. When you're trying to get someone to change their mind. And like what makes for a good leader is I'm never going to ask you to do something I haven't done. So then the question is, have you ever totally revolutionized the way that you look at the world because you got new evidence? For a lot of people, it's no. Mm. And it's like, if you haven't had a revolution of your view of reality, I I don't respect you as a leader if you're asking me to do that. You know, yeah. So it's almost like a requirement if you're ever gonna dare to ask someone to change their mind, like, what have you changed your mind on? Yeah. Yeah, I can think, I mean, I know you weren't, you were asking a hypothetical question, but I'm thinking about that. What are those moments for me? One, I was an angry atheist. Yep, Ang <laughs> I was an angry atheist. And I did that, you know, MDMA, psilocybin, guided shamanic vision quest journey when I was 18. Oh shit, my body evaporated and this thing that exists, like the only thing that makes sense is to call it a soul. Well, I guess I'm not an atheist anymore, right? Like that, but it forced me to do that. And it was this massive shift, like, holy shit, all I got in my library are Christopher Hitchens books yep. and Same, you know <laughs> why I'm not a Christian from Bertrand Russell and yeah. why Christianity must change or die by John Shelby Spong. And I'm like, ah, well, I mean, I understand some of their points about the relig re religiosity of it yeah. and some of the faults, but there's god i yeah. i know that now and so that was a huge moment but it was it was the plant medicine was the catalyst for that and there's been many times where plant medicine was a catalyst for these big changes and i think that's why these transcendent experiences are so important because you can't argue with them right like you you just go through the process of the death and rebirth ayahuasca does that reliably the one of the times that i can say where i really dramatically changed my mind was in the polyamory journey and it wasn't plant medicine related it was from reading uh chris ryan's book sex at dawn because i had an entire relationship with caitlin in which i was quite happily believing that it's in the masculine nature to fight to the death to prevent any other men from getting close to their lovers but for men it's just natural we're like lions you know or we're like bulls or something where this is just the the evolutionary bio biological nature and we can't fight it yeah. so it's it's okay for me to want to accumulate you know more women but for for women you know it's it's my innate nature to fight to the death and then i read chris ryan's book and he's like nah bitch you're more like a bonobo <laughs> you know like yeah. and here's all the tribes that acted a completely different way and i was like damn like I got that way wrong. And then that is what spurred this open egalitarian polyamory where both Whitney and I were allowed to see who we wanted to see. Yeah. Brutal, but it was a massive change of change of heart. But there's not even, you know, a lot of times those things happen gradual, but it's it's an interesting question for people to look and say, like, okay, like when are those moments? When are those moments for me? Was it was it graceful? How did I handle it? you know what what right. happened in that process yeah. how tumultuous was it you know how could i be better supported through that process wow this is such a whole new like field of interesting questions to feel into because like it's almost like one of the most sacrilegious things that you can do with plant medicine is to give someone a psychedelic without their consent yeah and like what we're doing when we're trying to change people's minds through arguments is we're trying to give them the same type of death and rebirth experience without their consent. And it's like, have have we both agreed to enter a space where this is the type of experience that's potentially capable of happening? I think the really important question, like the really interesting question for people to feel into is, have you done the due diligence on your belief where you believe that you have the confidence to ask someone to actually change their mind. 
Yeah. Because in my experience, almost no one that I know who has a belief about what Bill Gates is doing or what the why is, where the who and the blah, blah, blah. I, they haven't done it with the type of earnest and rigor for their own exploration that would justify them saying, yeah, you know what? I when when I really soften into it, I do believe that I've earned the ability to ask someone to have an ego death mm-hmm. for my idea. Yeah, it's like I haven't met almost anybody. Yep. Yeah, it's it's powerful for people to realize, and and ultimately, what that does is it brings back some compassion, 100%. and it brings back some like, okay, I understand, I understand what what where we're at, and I understand why you're you know, so vigilant about this. You're defending your ego life. You're defending your ego life. And I, I get it. And that when my, even whatever I'm proposing is is an attack on that. That's why, you know, the bias is so strong that even in, in the face of factual new evidence, people are reticent to accept it. We've talked about this on different occasions, like in these different cultish or conspiratorial circles they'll make a prediction this thing is happening it doesn't happen people double down on their conviction because their belief their whole identity is wrapped up in that in that story and in that belief so they just have to transfer it immediately to this other thing i mean i don't know how many fucking times i heard that trump was going to be the president this time it was like one after the other somebody somebody in some you know tangential circle would be like well you know let's enjoy it while you can biden because fucking trump i'm like what how many times are you gonna say that yeah like how many fucking times yeah and but they would and there's i think they're probably still out there it's like ah oh, it's just coming the swamp's gonna get clean now <laughs> no it's not no it's not it's not happening you know the fucking recounts are not happening yeah you know and, and i'm not even that sure about that but just based on the evidence like but that's not the way people act the people act are like doesn't matter what the world is showing them their belief will supersede yeah. reality and their in their again it's confirmation porn they'll find the thing yeah. that they that feeds that desire to stay alive but but to have compassion oh you're just trying to stay alive right. like i get it sweetie like i get it babe like you're trying to stay alive it's it's all good the thing that arises when i you know, like really feel into those type of people that you're articulating is I think maybe the greatest psychotechnology that human has that humans have ever created is the scientific method. And I think people really misunderstand or conflate the scientific method with scienceism and they're not the same thing. Like the essence of the scientific method is I'm going to generate a model of how I think something works. I'm going to then test it to try to disprove my model. Like that's like the essence of the scientific method that most people don't really connect to is the reason I experiment is to try to prove my intuition wrong. It's to try to break my model. I am seeking to break my model. And then whatever lasts after the rigorous attempts at breaking it, I hold that as a potential theory. Like that's how you even get to the point of a theory. And what's a lot of spiritual circles and then a lot of conspiratorial circles and then this new thing that's arisen in the last couple of decades because of the rise of corporations hijacking a lot of scientific institutions is scientism and it's where it's the appearance of science but it's we don't tell you how we find the answers we just tell you that it's science and then we give them to you and then you become the people who believe scientism are not scientists. They don't follow the scientific method. It's just another way of trying to, um, it's it's a type of marketing. It's and where it's, it, it's a religion. I mean, right. this is exactly, people say there's literally shirts and hats because science, period. That's the same as the church was saying when they were burning people for saying the world was round and revolved around the sun instead of vice versa like people were getting killed for that why because god yeah their interpretation of god obviously like that's not that's not science that's making it's deifying this thing and providing this certainty when it's not it's a method like you said it's a method right it's it's a process and like like 
the facts that the scientific method unveil is not science. They are the facts. Science is the process that creates them. And they are the facts while the time this is exactly their fact this is exactly the point that i was moving to is that because if you look at the history of science every fact has its death day but that doesn't mean that science isn't it means that science is working but so it's one of the things i think is super important for like our time is this like reconnection with the scientific method the process of I generate models about how I think things work. And then I actively seek to the best of my ability to disprove my model. And there's almost no one on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter who's talking about any of the politically charged issues who has genuinely spent an hour trying to actively disprove what they believe. I will put that on the fucking Vegas bet line. I'd I'll bet everything that I own that less than 0.1% of the people who are allowed on any social media have spent even an hour trying to actively disprove what they want to believe. Yeah. And you look at history and people have, there's been scientific consensus and then there's been people who in the dissenting, act, like everybody believes one thing. Oh, ulcers are entirely caused from stress. Like this right. is a, this is this famous one. And you know, Dr. Barry Marshall was like, no, it's caused by this bacteria, H. pylori. And I was like, get the fuck out of here. Like he was excommunicated from all of all of the sci scientific world, right? Yeah. It was a consensus reality. It got to such a degree, and he was he was so outcast by all of his peers and by science in general, that he eventually brewed up a little concoction and drank it himself and erupted into gnarly ulcers so and documented much respect. the thing, right? Yeah. There was a theory, you know, he had a, he had an opposing opinion to the theory and now everybody knows like, oh yeah, H. pylori ulcers, that's yeah. it. But it is the process, everything evolves, whether it's physics or whether it's, you know, whether it's medicine or what, like we're uncovering more and more nuance and more and more information. And this is something that, I feel like is one of the few things that I can stand for, which is, no, we need to open up the discussion. We need to look at all possibilities. We can't squash these doctors and these scientists. We have to hear them all in a chorus and try to make sense out of, yeah. out of the questioning of these things and give, okay, is this a viable, is this a viable hypothesis? All right, well, let's take a look at it. You know, let's take a look. There's some preliminary indica indicative studies that ivermectin may be helpful. These clinical studies have come out. Not, they're not compelling yet. They don't have the power to show, but it's like, all right, there's enough evidence there. Let's take a look at it. Let's really take a look at it. But is that what the world is doing? No. And again, I'm not saying I know that it works. I don't fucking know. There's enough of a credible hypothesis that the world should be like, fucking cool yeah let's how can we get and you know some of this some of these resources together to study this what if it works what if it works wouldn't that be amazing yeah you know but that's not the attitude why like that's the interesting thing that's where for me i get i get a sense of and again it's not certainty it's not epistemological certainty there's always epistemological humility maybe yeah. i'm thinking about something wrong maybe the pursuit of this is actually going to cause some other harm i'm open to that like i'm open to being wrong but i do believe that we're in a world where we have to look at all of these different possibilities yeah. and really analyze them and with with patience and see like okay like what is what is what is this? Yeah. Okay, is this how, this is an indication that looks good? All right, let's double down and see. Let's do whatever it takes to see, honestly, if that's helpful or not. And that's one of the criticisms I have is that people are so biased and there's such a strong desire to stick to one narrative. And then there's the counter narrative. But there's not the discourse that's allowing yeah. this information and the method to actually work as science is supposed to work. The thing that comes to mind when I uh listen is well two one is i always have this instinct inside of me to try to steal man whatever the position is that the other person is like talking about and uh god bless my family uh specifically my mom while i was growing up because they felt that i that it was me actively trying to like 
uh, be annoying, but it's almost like there's this instinct in me, like, oh, we're starting to get away from the middle. Like we're starting to get away from balance, even though I don't act actively hold this, what's well, something that I can say to bring it back. And the thing that was coming up was for our most recent fit for service summit, I was responsible for um, creating a dance uh, for like 24 people. And we only had like two or three days in person to do this. And on the first day, we come up with some good ideas and we start moving through the ideas. And then this thing happened where like everyone started to have an opinion. And then everyone had an opinion about someone else's opinion. And, you know, and then it just, it got to the point where I could feel as the leader for af like after an hour, it's like, we are losing the thread. And I could feel like, I don't know what the right thing to do is, but I know I have to pick something and we have to do it now and then we'll go from there. And if the microcosm is like the macrocosm and we steal men, these groups, and assume that they're genuinely good people trying their best with what they have with where they're at and that they're not a comic book level style evil thing, where it, which is a anthropomorphization of the devil that is an illusion anyways, if you really understand the true nature of God. And um, it might be like that dance move where it's like, no, we've we found this it works well enough we don't want to hear the other things we, we've just got to do this because people are dying mm -hmm. you know and like so that's a steel man thing that comes up and then um and that's it's important it's important to understand that that is you know like the occam's razor the principle of sufficient reason like mm -hmm. that's most likely what the majority of yeah. these actors these people who are doing this majority it's probably where it's coming from honestly it's like no 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 no. we can't we got one thing we got to focus on that one thing we got to clear all the other things out exactly because i've doesn't done mean, that in business doesn't yeah. mean that it's right no but it means like that motivation doesn't doesn't it doesn't necessitate a huge evil conspiracy right. it doesn't now it doesn't preclude no that there's collusion between big tech big pharma and politicians there's certainly a lot of money that's circulating between them there's you have to be open to all of those hypotheses maybe there is no collusion maybe there's self-serving bias in certain cases and maybe there's just genuine i believe that this is right for you know and there's epistemic you know hubris hubris where they're saying like i know what's right for, for the sure. world and it's the fucking vaccine and everybody else shut the fuck up okay that's but that could be because people would just want to help people like yeah. and really like understanding like all of these things that we we are all the judgments that we have about people probably not right most people want to do the right thing most people want to be yeah. good very rare to find someone who's intentionally evil right was i have I, I haven't met someone yet I right mean, was I mean the argument of whether Hitler himself was intentionally evil, or whether he thought that creating a master race was somehow right. beneficial long term? I don't know. I don't fucking know the guy, but there's enough evidence to say that it's possible that he thought, as the arbiter of some of the greatest evil the world has ever seen, he might have thought he was doing good. Thought doesn't mean yeah. he's right, and I'm, I'm not sure. trying to. He's just, but. That's this will be taken out of context for people if you want to. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's that's the thing though. Like, it's very rare to to have someone who's intentionally right. intentionally evil, and that's why I understand also why people are saying it's the fucking reptilians. Why? Because we can't even imagine. We can't even imagine ourselves that people would be this evil. Yeah, because it doesn't make sense. Because it's so it's so weird to think that people would be so evil. So like, well. Well, it's the reptilians are possessed by these fi these fucking aliens that do it. But then you're going, no, you're really kind of stretching it. And it doesn't Bachman mean is having a seizure in his grave. Yeah, <laughs> it doesn't mean that it's impossible. And that's again epistemic humility. Yeah. Okay, maybe, maybe I kind of I believe in aliens. Maybe there's bad aliens. Yeah. Maybe the fucking bad aliens. Have, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. The thing that I can feel like. uh I love how ayahuasca can connect me to my body in a way that I'm not used to being connected to, but I could feel as you were going through that, my body was getting hot. Be, like it was starting to like become overstimulated because I could feel like there's a veil 
uh, that you can move beyond where you're starting to try to make sense of things that are beyond your direct experience. Once you move beyond that veil, you can drown out there. You can lose your goddamn mind. You can be quote unquote possessed, but I mean that metaphorically or psychologically, but it's, it's dangerous territory. And like to anchor this back and to go for your win, there is a way to cultivate your direct experience, which is your world inside of that veil in such a way where it feels like home. It feels like it nourishes you. You, you know how to cultivate meaningful relationships. You know how to do things that give you flow. Like if you're spending all of your time beyond the veil trying to sense make about what the world is or whether or not aliens might be good or bad and they're possessing, like, <laughs> and you don't know how to get flow from working out or from doing a type of art or music that you love, you will not last. You will have burnout at best and at worst, you might have a psychotic break. Yep. Like there are things that need to be done to maintain the home that will allow you the resources to go fucking skirplunking or whatever the fucking word <laughs> is into the abyss of the uh, splunking splunking into the epistemological chaos. Yeah. Yeah, I think um this is the this is the long roundabout way to talk about <laughs> the, how talk about the map, but <laughs> it's it's ultimately the the thing is is that what we're talking about which is something we talk about is these surrogate missions can be very can be very dangerous because they can be very harmful you know like there's but the but the impetus to have that mission makes sense yeah you know and the, the example you know one example would be joining joining the military for a cause that you realize is fucked up like you're doing this for the wrong reason. I think that happened to a lot of people in Vietnam. Now, again, I don't have the I don't have the expertise to decide <laughs> whether Vietnam was good or bad. I tend to believe that it was bad, but I don't fucking know for sure. But a lot of the people who came back, this is for sure. A lot of people were like, "What are we doing here?" You know, and and that kind of idea of okay, you join this thing, you think you're in a mission. I'm going to fight for America. I'm going to fight for freedom. And when you get there and you get disillusioned. And you're actually killing people as yeah. part of this, and and this can happen in gangs. This can happen in mobs. This can happen. Everybody who, with pitchforks and fire, went to burn a witch, you know, like that's a they were had a they were fired up for a for a surrogate mission. That yeah. witch was probably just healing people with herbs, which is something we're like, oh great, you know, Granny's healing us with herbs now. We don't have the same mindset as we did back then, but those things that can be dangerous but the but the impetus towards them we can have compassion like okay i get it you want something that matters and you want to tilt yourself tilt your lance towards something that you think is productive but again going back to ignorance like be careful be careful what you attach yourself to in case that it's very dangerous in case that you're leading towards you know whatever future dystopia this is some yeah. 1984 dystopian authoritarian totalitarian scheme in believing that you're doing something that's helpful or conversely maybe you're leading to the rampant and unnecessary spread of disease agents you know i have my own opinion but nonetheless be 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 gentle like be careful yeah. about the missions that you're so certain about and that's why ultimately for me, the mission that I could for sure be certain about is I'm for sure certain that we need to come together as a people. And that's why United Polarity was the thing. I was like, okay, okay. Like I fucking, I know, I know this. I know that we need to come. And it doesn't preclude the fact that if someone breaks into my house, you know, and tries to rape my wife and kill me, I'm going to shoot him. I'm going to shoot him. I'm not going to try to unite my polarity with them and kumbaya. Like I understand there's boundaries yeah. and things like that. But in general, we all have to come together and that's something that i can really stand for and so you know this is this is the roundabout way to get to the one of the key principles i mean it's the reason why it's part one of the course like find your mission like know your mission know the draw towards a mission know the importance of the mission and try to do your best to make sure it's a good mission the thing that arises is there's this beautiful little book um, the Lions Tracker's Guide to Life. And it's like 
It's like a modern day Tao Te Ching that's hidden inside of a really quote unquote simple story that perfectly captures the essence of what going for your win is. And one of the things that stands out the most in that book is like the utility and um, beauty of discovering that you had gone down the wrong path and how that's essential to finding the right path. The only way you're not going to find your win is if you don't try. If you earnestly seek, congratulations if you fail, because that's actually moving you significantly closer towards like what the angel inside of you wants to dance through you. And that when you do it, there's, we should give a name to it, but there's moments where you're in the just right place, doing the just right thing, that's having the just right effect, where there's this instant feeling of everything that I've ever gone through has been worth it because it has brought me to this moment. Mm. And like, those are like the bread crumbs that you get for going for your win. And like mm. you and I have talked about this, but like when you experience that once and you go back to your daily life, you can kind of explain it away. If you experience it twice, maybe you get curious. But once you experience it like three times, there, there's this part that starts to arise where it's like, I know you're going to forget. I know you're going to be upset. You're going to be frustrated. You're going to bitch about this person, about how they're driving. But at the depth of your like weeping, like when things are the hardest, you're going to remember that a moment like this is coming. And like, it's when you talk about if you, if you can make hindsight foresight. Mm-hmm. And that really feels like that's like the ultimate boon of going for your win is that it allows you to like be able to be in hell. Yeah. So ultimately, once you have the mission, then we go into profession. This is how you make your money. These things, if you're, if you're lucky and if you're skilled, you can put those things together. Your profession is in service of your mission. However, it's always in service of your mission because it's always providing you the resources right. that you need to survive and you need to survive to be on your mission. So it's just making the, you know, <clears throat> carving out the difference between your mission and your profession. Sometimes it's exactly the same thing and you're earning money doing exactly what your mission is. Sometimes it has to be a little bit separate. We go through that, the importance of connections. I mean, to, to accomplish, we have to accomplish everything we want to accomplish together and how to forge these strong connections. The, you know, I talk about the difference between uh, squirrel wealth and bear wealth, mm-hmm. you know, and I'll tell that story real quick. So I had this really interesting metaphorical, you know, download about how squirrels are always hoarding their wealth in different little nut piles. You know, they harvest some nuts, they dig a little hole and they, and they put their nuts in a pile. Well, they could forget where their nut pile is. And they have to do. Yeah. And so, or some other, you know, enterprising squirrel could go f- discover their nut pile and take it away. And this is like our money. There's lawyers that are out there for our money. There's things that happen. The money is not a safe place of resources. However, then there's the bear. And the bear doesn't hide anything in a hole. The bear fattens himself up with all the berries, all the salmon, all of the things that the bear can possibly eat. And the bear becomes robust. And that wealth is with him. And if you want the bear's wealth, the bear's not going to forget where it is. It's him. If you want the bear's wealth, you got to fight the fucking bear. Good luck. You know, like that's the, that's the reality of the bear. And the bear, bear wealth for us is our connections. It's, our, it's the people we know and the people who love us and we love them like those those aren't as fickle yeah all right there may be a falling out or something may happen just like a you know something may happen to a bear but nonetheless like they're solid and they're there and we can count on them and and they're so important to in many different reasons but in in many ways more important than the wealth that you acquire in any other way 100 percent. the highest correlation to all cause mortality is not how much money you make no it's not what you weigh it's not what you eat it's whether or not you feel lonely yeah and that you personally know billionaires and if their connections aren't good their lives aren't good That's period right. and i would i would venture to say that it's you know <clears throat> so many people who've been really successful with their mission like you talk to anybody who's really good it's could be an athlete ah oh, you know all my credit goes to my coaches and my teammates 
you know, you talk to, I was talking to John Vivek, he's one of the most brilliant philosophers, and I, I reflected that to him, and he's like, ah, you know, all the credit to the giants whose shoulders I was standing on who've come before me from Plato onward and to all my colleagues and even to my students who I'm constantly learning from. It was like immediate, you know, it was like, he knows, he knows why he's so fucking good, myself included, yourself included, yeah. like, who are we without our connections, without yeah. our allies? Dead. <laughs> yeah, truly, truly. Like one of the things that I try to softly recommend to people when they say that they feel like uh, they're lonely or people don't care about them or if they're having a hard time connecting to gratitude, and it's that wherever you are, like in order for you and I to be in this room talking into this microphone, probably you could make the argument billions of people over the course of hundreds of years had to do all of their just right thing for the inventions to be made for the technology to exist for the infrastructure to be here for all these parts from all over the world being mined and alchemized into shapes that weren't naturally what it was to get to the point in this room like to to be upset is because you are in a nest of thousands and thousands of people having done the just right thing at the just right time in order for you to even be alive, to be able to feel uncomfortable or to feel alone. Yeah. And then, you know, moving, so moving into the second segment, because we, we also talk about passion, we talk about vibration, those are all important things. That, but what's really I want to get into is what you're talking about is discomfort. And we live in the most comfortable world, despite that it's been internally very uncomfortable. You know, our mentally. Our meat in, suit comforts. Yeah, our meat suit comforts are through the fucking roof. That's making us sick. Yeah. Internally, though, you know, higher rates of depression, lower rates of happiness, you know, more mental disorders, suicides, all of these different indicators, these canaries in the coal mine of how we're really doing are all shit. Yeah, And one of the things that I really recognized going through this last ayahuasca cycle <laughs> with El Dragón de la Selva, the dragon of the jungle, uh, it was so fucking hard. It was so fucking hard. Like probably one of the, actually the most important thing that I got out of that was dealing with how fucking hard it was. Yeah. Like it was absolute i mean there's a, a lot of beauty to it too but i had to create adaptations to the difficulty of it that will serve me for the rest of my life yeah like i can't even the night two <laughs> <laughs> night two i declared was the most profoundly difficult experience i'd ever had and it was up until that point it was it was like i was a hundred watt bulb and there was 500 watts of god energy coming through and i was barely holding the glass together it was like i'm gonna fucking burn and burst and so what did i i was i had speaking in this insectoid language and shaking my body and tapping and breathing and vomiting incessantly and like it was like whoa this is hard yeah and so I started to learn, like I started to learn all of these different, and in, in, in number two, I learned all of the physical ways to get more comfortable. Like, and those were all the things that I was talking about, the ways to offload energy. Yeah. Fortunately, Makad was right next to me. He had a fan and I would use the fan to like move energy. I was like offloading current so my light bulb didn't fucking explode. Yeah. I was really valuable. And I was like, man, that was some, that was some shit. That was hard. And I trusted myself. I made it through. I made it through. I fucking made it through. I, my feet at the end of that night were on the grass. I'm looking up at the moonlight and the stars. And I'm like, God damn, man, you fucking made it through. Yeah. On your own, on your mat, in the dark, you made it through. Like, hell yeah. And there was a sense of like, I can make it through anything. Then night three, <laughs> and he gave me like, I was the night two, he has his own very strong brew that he brought from home that i was privy to and he, he gave me a third of a cup of that and night two and i had that type of night and then night three <laughs> night three fills it up to the brim like fills it up to the <laughs> brim and 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 i was like oh oh no oh no <laughs> oh wow oh no that feeling of right before drinking where you feel your body go oh no those are <laughs> yeah. the i was like what like how, how what what is this gonna be like and sure enough, that then took the fucking cake of the most difficult experience. Different though, because 
in that in that ceremony it was like a four-hour bufo 5meo journey and for anybody who's gone through that journey there's this russian this expansiveness of like into the god space into the void of just whoa yeah. whoa whoa right like that that moment of like holy shit and then there's the tough like coming back into your body moment of like oh man i'm like whoa i'm like somewhere in between and i'm uncomfortable and i'm thirsty and does someone have blankets and i need to puke and i'm like cold and like help like nurture me <laughs> well in the bufo ceremonies there's always people to do that there's, and it's like 10 minutes <laughs> yeah there's like loving angels who are there through this whole process like helping you like moving your bowl like helping you with blankets like you're th- they're there for you and this one it was just me in the dark for four hours going through that in cycles <gasps> long bouts of cycles oh, oh, fucking it was like that was the most difficult thing i'd ever gone through and through that all through that all there was this massive liberation like this wow wow like if i can make it through that and again this is like some people like that's not hard bro like i'll show you hard i'll fucking hardest objective right so for me in my life and i'd venture to say if if anybody else wants to try it's also objectively hard but subjectively it was the hardest thing hardest thing i could possibly imagine going through and and with that, you know, there came this new sense of self that developed and the adaptations that I developed. I developed this sweetest, kindest, most loving voice in my head. Not the suck it up, suck it up, you fucking pussy. Like get it together. Like all oh, this voice that's been patterned. And I know, you know, that's not proper PC language, but my inner judge doesn't give a fuck. <laughs> he doesn't. It'll, it'll call me whatever shitty name it wants to call me to try to get me to buck up and like be a man and deal with it and suck it up you know that voice was not helpful and i did not sir and i could not have survived it so another really sweet and loving voice came through like it's okay baby i know it's hard it was like talking to me like i was a little child yeah like it's okay it's okay i know i know i know and that was sometimes slowly like verbalizing and sometimes like it just in my head and that self-soothing like the process of havening where you like rub yourself and like i know i I really like that i know yeah creating that inner haven like i know i know i know it's hard i know i know i know like going through that that voice is now with me permanently i forged like a new ally like a loving kind compassionate mother and i have both voices sometimes (laughs) i need to be like what the suck it up just fucking step in the cold plunge yeah don't be a bitch again that's my judge it's not very pc but that's what like that's what the judge in my own head will say right right? and now there's this other voice you know and so now i have another like whole ally so the point of this long story is is that in going for your win which is a challenging task which is in some ways preparing me i think for this my new win my new mission is i had to go through some hard shit i had to learn and cultivate that and that's one of the things that's one of the segments it's it's chapter nine of this but there's many others but each one of these things is like an infinite depth of importance in how you get to where you're going there's hardly anything that i that can talk about that i've been through that's significant that isn't really reflected somewhere in this map the image that comes up that i think is super powerful here is uh the man who wrote anti-fragile i forget his name um but that is he he's a economist and an incredible uh philosopher and he wrote this book anti-fragile and he explained there's three types of systems there's fragile systems there's systems that um can be rebuilt if they are hurt by stress so there's fragile systems break from stress there are systems that can be rebuilt after stress. And then there's systems that get stronger because of stress, and those are anti-fragile. And the three mythical archetypes he used to explain those is a fragile system is like the sword of Damascus. If it hits something harder than it, it's broken and it's gone. Mm. Um, then the second type of system is like the phoenix. It can be overwhelmed, but it can be reborn, but it comes back at same level of strength. And then there's the hydra. 
And the hydra is you can fucking cut off its head and two heads come up. The human nervous system is anti-fragile. It's one of the only, like the human nervous system and nature, mm. like are some of the only things that exist that are truly anti-fragile. And that your nervous system and every aspect of your existence will get stronger by going through damage. Like that's how your muscles grow. That's how your immune system grows. That's how you learn new things. And that there is a line that if you cross, you break in a sense that it can't fix. But we have evolved to believe that that line is hundreds and hundreds of feet closer than where it actually is. And like the point of cold baths and saunas and really hard workouts and purposefully making yourself do shit that you're afraid to do is that nothing will make you grow as exponentially as doing the things that you don't want to do that are in alignment with your mission. And that's, for me, that's what, that's the gift of ayahuasca. It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, there's beautiful visions and things that feel super good in my body, but it's the pain. It's the like, there's no way that I, that I can handle this. And then afterwards I come back to the 3D reality and it's like, I can handle my email. Yeah. You know, <laughs> right. I can go have that conversation that I was afraid of before because I fucking was on the God rocket ship for four hours feeling like I was going to explode from the inside and I somehow managed to get through it. Right. Yeah, that, that can't be, it can't be overstated the importance of that. You know, like it's, it's essential. And, you know, there's so many other things that, you know, we talk about harnessing your belief, you know, how to use that, how to weaponize your belief, how to practice stillness, you know, a place from which you can have real insight into what's going on internally and externally. Cause if you're moving and the world's moving at the same time, everything's going to be a little bit blurry. Yeah. Um, wielding choice, like choice is like choice. I had this great, I had this great conversation today with John Verveke and uh, that podcast will come out in a, in a couple of weeks from this release. Um, but one of the things we were talking about is he was talking about the difference between hot flow and cold flow mm. and hot flow being like that classic example of, you know, like surfing down the face of a wave, like hot flow, like everything disappears. It's just that thing. But cold flow is what can happen in a discourse. I would, I would venture to say that we're in cold flow right now yeah. in a podcast or an interesting dialogue or his method of actually circling and then going through different, you know, Socratic methods of questioning and mirroring and reflecting back and forth you can get in this kind of cold flow state. And I was, I was talking to him about how in polyamory, when I was, you know, for people who don't know, which most people do, I was polyamorous for close to eight years, my former partner. And in the state of novelty with a new person, those first, you know, few dates are like, you're, you're, it's have such rapt attention, both of you, that it's so magnetic. It's so exciting. You're telling your stories like you're telling them for the first time. You're listening to their stories with rapt attention. And it's that's what draws so much of the magnetism and the energy of those is that that novel experience. And with that novel, that ex, that reverence and the in the presence of that. And I and I realized that a, a while ago, not understanding that that is actually what he would call cold flow. Like you and of course it feels so good. Flow state is activating all of the chemicals that actually in our internal pharmacopoeia that make one of the most pleasurable states on the planet. How would you define the difference between the two just to help me? Like what are the qualities that are different? Yeah, cold flow is much more sustainable and elongated. Mm. And it's it's rapt attention, but it's not like being in the absolutely in the zone where there's like nothing else. And like one of the classic states of Chi uh flow state is, you know, there's there's like a, a certain amount of risk right in there right like there doesn't need to be risk interesting like if you're in if you're in one of these uh dialogos conversations or if we're in this like there's not a lot of risk i mean there's stakes i guess there's a podcast but even if there wasn't if you're in a really good conversation then there's no yeah. risk so yeah. it's just a sustainable it's sustainable rapt attention okay and it can happen like even like when We've gotten into that just talking about stuff. When Charles Eisenstein stays at my house, we'll just sit down at a table and we'll start talking. And we would be in like cold flow, like nothing else really matters. We're right there with each other. Podcasts just do that reliably. 100%. 
So the, the wielding choice to bring it back to that, which is one of the modules here, I was talking about how with Vailana, now we're in a, I'm in a monogamous relationship with Vailana. So we have to intentionally create situations that create that flow state. We don't have the novelty or the, you know, reclamation urges from polyamory that bring about these, these kind of force majeure effects that cause us to be in flow. We have to intentionally choose it. Yeah. And, and that was one of the things you're saying is like, that's exactly it. Like you can get to this by intentionally choosing to recognize the inherent novelty of any situation. You know, like no situation is the same. Right. And choose with reverence and choose to make it sacred and choose to like go deeper. But it's a choice. Yeah, It's a choice. And that choice requires practice. Yep. You have to choose it and practice it over and over until you can get to that where every situation you can be like that every cup of tea can be like your first cup of tea like don miguel ruiz every huh. sip of wine was like his first sip of wine yeah. every sunset was like that how did he do that he's enlightened no he probably chose somewhere he chose he chose that yeah and that's like that's the fucking power of choice but we think like oh yeah choose this whatever mm -mm. choose gratitude Ooh, that's a fucking powerful choice. Can you choose gratitude? Of course you can. It's just hard. Can you choose to love yourself? Yes. Yeah. One of the really interesting things to feel into is I can feel that when I'm in a certain mood, there's something in me that knows that I can choose gratitude. And it's like, no. Yeah. And like, yeah. that is clearly an indication that there is a part of me that wants to be upset or right. wants to be sad or wants to be <laughs> right. ungrateful. Right. And the other thing that came up from what you were saying that perfectly fits into the comfort zone thing is it is almost a 100% certainty that if you choose to do something beyond your comfort zone, you will experience novelty. You will find cold flow. Yeah, that's it. Find that, find that area where it, is on, where it is a little bit uncomfortable. Try not to be present beyond your comfort zone. Like <laughs> yeah, it's gonna yeah, bring your totally. full apparatus to it. Totally, and that's another, so going into module three, which is overcoming resistance, one of the themes is using fear as a compass. And that is such a fucking game changer, man. Right, right. And it's not like, and differentiating, important to differentiate fear yeah. and danger. You know, like, all right, there's real danger. You know, I get it, but then there's a lot of fear that we have that is not actually dangerous to the organism. It's just perception of danger to our culturally indoctrinated, conditioned ego structure that believes it's only good if it does this one thing or the, this other thing. That is where the comfort zone is, you know? Or sometimes it has to do with conditioning. You know, Wim Hof, I was, I've been doing a lot of cold plunging lately. Um, we did one the other day. But I was wrecking You destroyed me. The part of me that gets <laughs> self worth from comparison and numbers did not leave that feeling like he was worthy. <laughs> I really started to understand because I've been doing it so much, my attitude and so consistently. I mean, I've done it for many years, but it's been inconsistent. But I've been every day. Every, I mean, I haven't missed a day. Sometimes a couple times a day I've been doing it and always with like, you know, deep, you know, head immersions. And Wim Hof would always say, cold is an emotion. And I'd be like, I just got goosebumps. I was like, yeah, that's kind of a cool gangster thing to say. <laughs> but then I realized it. Like, what is the difference? Why is now it's not cold? It's not, it's, I don't even, I don't even experience it in the same way as cold. I know it's cold, but I don't experience cold the same way. It's a sensation. Yeah. But what made it cold to me what, was my feeling about the cold, my emotion about the cold. You're like instinctual reaction that if I feel this sensation, stop or get right, away from. Right, and so it was this this fear emotion that was linked in, in this aversion to the discomfort and my preference of a different type of sensation. But now as that's softening, the experience is changing and I'm like rapaciously looking forward to my cold plunge. It's like, oh, should I do one now or later? Both, <laughs> Right. you know, it's like I'm in right. this like whole new, whole new state and i and like this is the thing that we can recognize is you start pushing through it and then things things radically shift things like radically become different yeah the example that's coming up for me is one of the greatest reframes is connecting to physiologically excitement and anxiety right before performing a task 
it's the same physiological reaction. It's your frame about whether or not you feel competent in the actions you will have to perform in the thing that you're about to do that then creates the lens about whether or not you think it's anxiety or excitement. But that physiologically it's the same and that the more that you go do the things that give you that feeling, the more that you can train your body through the repetition, that it's safe to feel this and still act. Yep. You know, because one of the things about anxiety is that if you feel that feeling and then you choose to not act because of that feeling, it reinforces that that feeling is something to turn away from. And then your sphere of competence gets smaller and smaller. Yeah. Generalized anxiety is a bitch. It's like a, it's something that I've, you know, and it's, it's interesting, like it is, it is also linked with depression as well and i've experienced both of these it's like anxious 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 fuck it hopeless yeah and then the anxiety leaves like doesn't matter doesn't fucking matter and i take the pressure off because it's hopeless but somehow the anxiety is is like if i just do it a little bit better if i do it right and if i don't make any mistake if i just get it right things will things will work out and then if i stay in that state too long i'm fucking completely burnt out and exhausted so i'll just be like nope fuck it doesn't matter anyways and then i'm depressed which is awful i hate that feeling but it's like oh it's the only way to get the relief thankfully and then the other the other side is when i'm inspired and i feel on purpose and i feel like i do now and ultimately like a lot of work i've I've actually hired peter crone as a coach should i tell you that yeah Mm -hmm. um a lot of what he's talking to me about is how changing all of my relationship to the external and of course focusing it on internal and so not relying on the fact that i have this external mission that's now made me internally comfortable because this is going to work for now but and it's very important and it's very good but a lot of the important work is that to work on myself internally to kind of mitigate that as well but it's a i have the deepest compassion for people who are or between those two different yeah. you know, Scylla and Charybdis, anxiety and depression, and I and I fucking get it. You know, I get it. And for me now, at my level of mastery, the thing that gives me relief is to know that I'm absolutely on mission. I have a clear mission for one, and then I know what to do. And I know then once I know what to do, I'm competent in executing what I need to, right. what I need to do. And so everything starts to work in alignment ideally i'll get to a level of mastery where even if my mission changes because the world changes because of course you know united polarity won't be my thing forever maybe it will who knows but can i not go back to the place that i was yeah. you know without that and uh that's the deep work and the thing that has been like we were talking earlier about like the things that you've changed your mind on For 10 years, my motherfucking mantra was, if you have depression, if you have anxiety, all we got to do is fix your stories. Let's just fix your stories. We'll do it with the mind. And it took me 10 years of studying psychology and seeing how it wasn't working in specific ways and then studying trauma in the last two years where I realized, oh, the only reason it feels like that to me is because I don't have a massively traumatized, dysregulated nervous system. And so I can operate in the illusion that all it is is stories, but really connecting to, if you have stored trauma in your body, it doesn't matter what story you choose. It doesn't matter what you're saying with your mind. You're gonna be afraid. You're gonna feel anxious. You're not gonna sleep well. You're gonna have like immunological disorders you likely will be depressed, your memory won't work very well, and it doesn't matter what the fuck I say to you. But if we do breath work for two hours, and you trust me, and the music is right, and you feel safe, you're gonna start shaking, and you're gonna start crying, you might start screaming. And then we might not have talked about anything, but for the next six months, you're gonna feel like a completely different thing than you felt for the last 15 years, and I was wrong and realizing that I was like fundamentally wrong about what I thought would help people. Mm. Like anxiety and depression um, might have nothing to do with story. and might have everything to do with a traumatized physiological nervous system. Yep. And I think uh, it's, that's where, as you 
shrink your ignorance ever so slightly and can open up to these different possibilities. Um, and then also, you know, to go back to that first thing, the more that you can identify as not your ego, but as the one who's learning, as the one who's not winning, but the one who's going for their win, the yeah. one who's just on this continued pursuit of knowledge, the in, in the philosophia, in the love and the pursuit of more wisdom, you know, that we can carry and embody. And as that one that's that's the journeyer, not the arrived, not the arrived, then at that point, it's all good. Hell yeah. It's all good. We'll just, we'll fucking keep going and we'll do it together. And that's another big part about the Go For Your Win is the community. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's, that's a huge element of it. It's just the community support, everybody pulling together. And uh, so, I mean, I, I've, I hope people find this map helpful. You don't have to buy the course if you don't want to buy the course, but it's really, it's a lot of powerful shit in there. It's a great community. Um, but if not, hopefully this podcast was, was helpful. And also you're offering some select spots to yeah. work with what up to uh, 20 people, which I cannot more highly recommend. E.G. Young here is a fucking gangster. So snag those spots while they last. And I really think that the best testimonial is um, Go For Your Win brought me here. You know, like I have pictures of what I look like when I started Go For Your Win, you know, and like I know who I am now. And uh, it was the map that catalyzed all of this. And so it really is an honor to be teaching it and to be sharing it with other people because it worked for me. Yeah. Yeah, man. Everything, uh, everything is you know, making more sense with that mission clarified, understanding that this is helping to give people a map and then fit for service, helping train people really through like hands-on training, all of the experiential practices. I mean, what we're about to do in Sedona is <laughs> fucking ridiculous. I don't think we've ever had more experiences on that. Breathworks, ecstatic dances, vision quests, soul wanders, you know, all of the mirroring and process of Steph and Chris. I mean, it's just fucking insane. Uh, Paul Selig, Matthias to Steph. I mean, it's the most ridiculous thing and a music festival. <laughs> but the point of this whole thing is that that's the training arm, you know, like, all right, let's train ourselves to be capable of serving the world and ourselves in the best way possible, become fit for service. What are the things that are going to level us up? What are all these experiential practices? I mean, it sounds like it's going to be a ball, but these things go deep. I mean, these things go deep, deep, deep. You know, people have really profound experiences so we have this that you know creates this initial map this overview of how to get your sights straight understand your mission fit for service and then the fit for service academy for those people who don't want to join for the in-person things and have that community that fit for service academy app fit for service and then now you know united polarity and uh and then a couple other things that are in the works but no need to <laughs> no need to worry about that but everything starts to fucking make sense and yeah. now I can breathe deep. Like, oh, I get it. I get it. I fucking get it. You've earned it, man. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks, brother. And thanks for all your support through all of this. And it's only it's only getting deeper. Amen. Amen. Um, I don't know. Tell people where to dive in more besides go for your win. Uh, my name on Instagram, uh, Eric Gatsi, and then also my website. And then the podcast is The Myths That Make Us. Hell yeah. I love you, brother. I love you too, man. And I love all you. Thanks for tuning in. Peace. Peace. Thanks for tuning into this video. Make sure you hit subscribe. Follow me at Aubrey Marcus. Check out the Aubrey Marcus podcast available everywhere and leave a comment. Let me know if this video resonated or what else you would like to hear from me in the future. Thank you so much.